Hello everybody, my name is Harry Thomas, I'm from Amsterdam Vista. We're just uh, about to wait for a few more people to join. Um, we're ready to start, let's say in about two to three minutes latest. So be patient and uh, we start in a second. I think uh, I believe we can start. Jake, are you ready? <laughs> yes. Thumbs up. Good. Very good. Thank yes. you. So, so, hello everybody. Uh, welcome to the uh, to the NVE seminar uh, together with Jake Novotky. My name is Harold Thomas. Um, we're we're uh, briefly introducing you to MR technology and uh, NVE's view about future uh, MR sensor technologies. Yeah. For those people who don't know us or don't know Amsterdam Fista, we're a uh, Swiss-based company and uh, we're uh, serving uh, sensors and power. And a big, big part of sensors business is uh, NVE's corporation products. So in our portfolio, we have sensors, power supplies, components, gas sensors, uh, drives, and we also do many more uh, of customized solutions. So it's very really brief look at the company if you have uh, questions later on you can use a chat function um, we have in between an interactive part that uh, we are asking you questions so uh, please please uh, click on those you will get about 15 to 20 seconds to answer those hold and, and then we go through the presentation um, and so uh, that's really the short part from my side um, the next part is from Jake Nomotki, he's Director of Strategic, uh, sales, strategic sales and NBE Corporation. I'm working uh, with the company a very long time and I'm happy to have Jake here in this session and uh, Jake, the floor is yours. Thank you, Harold. I'd like to thank everyone again for coming. I appreciate the opportunity to discuss some NVE technology that we've been developing and I hope we can generate a discussion that might lead to some new developments. As Harold said, my name is Jake Novotny. I'm Director of Strategic Sales at NV Corporation. NV Corporation is a manufacturer of uh, TMR and GMR sensor elements. Uh, we're headquartered in the USA. This presentation, I just briefly want to cover the advantages of GMR and TMR for industrial applications. Uh, many of you may know this already. Many of you may use some products, uh, but Maybe the TMR and GMR effects aren't familiar, so I want to briefly just discuss it, uh, highlight some of the key advantages. Next, we want to talk about NVE's approach. Uh, we've been working a lot on how can we integrate more functionality into a single IC? How can we offer customers a more complete solution that allows them to uh, extract more functionality out of the MR sensors and get better products, uh, enable better sensors. Uh, next, we want to talk about uh, common network buses. Uh, we'll discuss uh, some of the typical protocols used and uh, where they have advantages and disadvantages. And lastly, uh, pointing towards the future where we're looking at integrating some of our GMR, TMR ICs and actually having direct field bus interfaces. And then of course we have some time for questions. We look forward to hearing from you. So briefly, uh, the GMR effect is basically what NVE was found, founded on. Uh, we commercialized giant magnetoresistance, which is a technology using uh, parallel in-plane current conduction. You can check the figures on the right. It briefly summarizes the physics used in these products. So we have typical 
anti-ferromagnetic stack. And the point of the, the GMR effect is that the resistance of a thin metal layer can be modulated by the relative polarity of the magnetic fields. And as you apply a magnetic field, you will align more of the electrons in the top and bottom layers, which reduces electron scattering, therefore allowing electrons to flow more easily and getting a lower resistance state. The GMR has been commercialized for many years now because it has many key advantages. It's compatible with uh, sputter deposition and semiconductor processing techniques. You can make very small sensor elements as small as 10 microns squared, and the process is stable up to about 300 degrees C. You get a large output signal, up to 12% MR, and the noise is very low as well. You can have very uh, high resolution sensors. The other technology we've used is newer, but it's also very important, uh, perhaps more important for the future because it offers even more benefits to GMR is the TMR effect. Uh, the main contrast of TMR is that compared to GMR, the current is now flowing perpendicular to the plane of the magnetic stack. So it actually is going through an oxide barrier instead of scattering through a copper alloy barrier, some non-magnetic metal. In the case of TMR, we have an oxide barrier. So the action of electronic conduction is really uh, quantum tunneling. And so the probability of quantum tunneling will be significantly higher when you apply a magnetic field to align the electron magnetic poles. And similarly, uh, it's compatible with sputter deposition, but you can miniaturize the devices even more. Uh, the process is very stable at high temperatures and you get a much greater signal, up to 100% MR is typical for industrial application. And the signal noise ratio uh, can be improved even more compared to the GMR effect. So just with that brief introduction, maybe we pause and take a quick pop quiz poll. Uh, we'd like to know uh, if you use GMR or if you're curious about using GMR, which uh, advantage would you be most interested in using it for? So please, if you would, submit your vote. So thank you for uh, for the polls. Uh, it's about 50% is high accuracy that people are stating, and then uh, to high sensitivity, about 20%. Small sensor size is about 15%, and the others are the rest of the sizes. So very interesting. Thank Great. you for your feedback. And uh, Yes, thank you very much. Uh, the, the good thing is that uh, the GMR and TMR sensors can afford all of these advantages. So... Uh, <laughs> There's a sensor for every type of advantage you need. In general, the performance advantages of GMR and TMR are to reduce the size of the device, to lower the power consumption, and to offer a higher sensitivity. So you can detect a magnetic field, you can detect rotation speeds at a greater air gap distance. Also, you can get quite a bit of accuracy with a and magnetic GMR sensor. Uh, there are many approaches to getting higher accuracy with GMR and TMR. It involve some level of factory calibration or optimization in the manufacturing process or just simply engineering the, the TMR layers and the shape uh, that they're patterned into when they're making into a device. Uh, but in general, uh, we're looking at very small sensors sensors that are capable of very high accuracy, a very wide operating temperature range, low hysteresis error, low power consumption, and they also can operate at a very fast bandwidth. The typical applications that currently used for GMR and TMR, of course, uh, switches and proximity sensors, flow sensors, uh, also many type of encoder and current sensor are common. Uh, we would be curious to know uh, what measurement are you using GMR for or what measurement would you plan to use GMR for? If you have any feedback, please let us know. The pop quiz poll is open now.
It's uh, the most of the parts are encoding um, and angle. Encoder angle. And, and current. Yeah, I just checked. Um, I was waiting to see the result because the first poll I actually answered <laughs> this one, I didn't. But now I hit, I was waiting. Like, it's not showing up. So I hit submit vote. <laughs> then it showed. So I, I actually voted gear. So I boosted gear uh, a little bit. But, you know, gear oftentimes is used for encoder too. So it's a... Uh, uh, it's similar. Okay. Thank, Thank you very you. much, everyone. Uh, one approach that I'd like to talk about today are field programmable sensors, because this is an area that NV has focused on in the past years in order to improve the accuracy of our products. So discuss a few types. The first would be linear type. So what I have here in the bottom left, you can see uh, an image of a TMR transfer curve typical of something coming from a Wheatstone bridge. And what we've done is combine that with the digital core where you can offer some signal processing. And typically NV will do these at our own factory on uh, magnetic test handlers. We'll calibrate over temperature and over magnetic field and produce a highly linear output. Uh, these types is either lookup table or uh, six segment linear fit. Uh, they can be field programmable as well, though. And uh, where we're moving these products towards the future is allowing end users to program their own lookup tables and their own uh, linearity directly in the firmware. Because this allows a significant flexibility depending on your application. Now, many times, as you know, for linear encoder, uh, the magnetic field is not always a linear relation. So if you have to measure a distance, uh, you would have to convert something nonlinear into a linear function anyways. Uh, we figured that uh, it's best sometimes to let the end user define their own calibration because they can take into account the exact magnet they use rather than the ideal magnet that NV has on our test handlers. Similarly, we offer programmable switches. Uh, the most common use for the programmable switches is to get a very precise one-time programmable switch uh, they can be calibrated in the field or in your own uh, uh, manufacturing setup, I2C, SPI. Uh, we have switch points calibrated over temperature as well at the factory, and many different uh, configurations are possible, including not limited to uh, multiple switch outputs. But uh, most common is a single switch omnipolar or window comparator. Uh, the last one that I would highlight here is the angular sensors. Uh, angular sensors are common for rotor encoder, of course. Uh, the advantage of NV angle sensors is that the TMR effect allows very high sensing range. And the most common use for our products is to use them in what we call an off-axis configuration, actually. Uh, Harold, can you see my mouse? I, I forgot. Is that visible? Um, no. Okay. I will use words. <laughs> Excuse me. The bottom left corner, uh, we have an image of a typical magnet that's used for an absolute uh, angular encoder. It's a simple two-pole magnet, diametrically magnetized. The most common configuration for angle sensor is what we call on-axis end of shaft. Uh, that is the case when the sensor is placed uh, directly coaxial with the rotating magnet. But many times it's inconvenient. And when it is, you can use what we call off-axis configuration, where you move the sensor up or you move the sensor down. So it's not coaxial with the shaft anymore, but it's shifted. And in this case, uh, the TMR effect is very important because it's very sensitive. It can detect the magnetic field, even though the magnetic sensor is placed significantly further away. And these sensors can be used off axis without any calibration. But if you really want to have the highest accuracy, we recommend you put a calibration routine in there. And uh, this is why we're allowing customers the chance to put their own lookup table into the angular sensors. This is the, the direction we're moving these products. So uh, the best case for uh, a rotary encoder, you can use these in an off-axis configuration 
And sometimes you may not be able to place the sensor at the exact ideal place, depending on mechanical constraints. But you can still load your own lookup table in these, uh, what we call smart sensors, these smart angle sensors. And it allows you to make a precise angular encoder, even with a little bit of uh, non-ideal placement. As I pause briefly to have another poll. So uh, what kind of MR sensor are you using in your application or what kind are you interested in using? We're just curious about uh, whether you use a simple bridge, digital switch, or if uh, more functionality integrated is interesting. Is it working? Uh, oh, no. Okay. There it is. Sorry. Oh, did it go? That's the wrong one. <laughs> uh, whoops. Wait. Wait. Oh, there is, sorry, sorry for that mistake. There is a, there's another one. Okay. So the I think two polls may be active. Yeah. Let me check. Sorry for that unpublished poll. But there's one active. That's okay. Thank you, Harold. Sorry for the mistake. Um, it's more passive uh, and also programmable. Yeah, we give people some time to vote. Yeah. yeah. This. Uh... Have you seen the screen uh, for the poll, or is that did that pop up? Yeah, or? no, it's uh, it came a little late, and oh. then the, the wrong one flashed. So it's okay. Now, uh, the old one, or the, the future one yeah. that we've spoiled is uh, hidden now. Yeah. We'll return to it. OK. Yeah, it still remains there, like passive. Uh, with some yes, I see. Yeah, some yeah. passive, some programmable. Yeah. Mm -hmm. OK, some, so some we more. have uh, different <laughs> approaches depending on the application or the customer need. Uh, what I want to spend the last moment talking about, uh, besides just the type of programmable sensors we offer, uh, a new idea for directly interfacing sensors to network buses. Uh, NV has some functionality uh, we can design in these interfaces with network bus directly in some cases. I just wanted to briefly cover a few of the common ones for industry. Uh, first one is CAN, uh, working according to master principles, line structure, of course. Uh, CAN interface is, uh, is, is commonly used mainly due to simplicity, differential signaling. NV has some, uh, some hardware used for the CAN bus already, or isolators. Uh, but uh, this is something we see as potentially interesting for integrating into sensors as well. Uh, other uh, industrial protocols we see, uh, LIN, uh, this one is uh, one commander, uh, bridge to CAN and 16 responders together. And uh, IO link, uh, there we have the, the master to the PLC, but then you wire uh, sensors actuators separately. And IO link is, uh, is useful because you can have the, the simplified bidirectional communication with the power over cable technology. Uh, SPE, single pair ethernet. Uh, this case, uh, we have a, a simple two wire interface and NV has a, a capability to address these uh, SPE uh, directly in fact. Uh, we have uh, a possible SPI solution uh, to connect directly into SPE interface. So as an example here, we, we show the TMR smart sensor SM225 uh, linked over SPI directly and uh, how to interface to SPE bus. 
and uh, where we see some possibility for the future is uh, how can we make a sensor solution simpler by integrating uh, the functionality or maybe the stack and uh, hardware in form IC to put a sensor directly onto a field bus, say IO link. Uh, we were curious to know if you would help us with our last pop quiz. So what does the uh, connection interface an intelligent MR sensor should have? And uh, just curious to know what you're using currently. Yeah, so interesting at uh, I square C SPI by uh, about 60%, 25% is IO link and some some can. But no one at this point of time seeing it that maybe because of the reason that's uh, pretty pretty new. New, new yes. Yeah. Okay, yeah, so not so much visibility for SPE. Interesting. Thank you, everyone. I appreciate that. You're able to save the results of the polls, right, Harold? Hmm. Yeah, okay. Okay. Uh, so just uh, summaries about the field bus. Uh, so there are some limitations for existing field buses. Uh, mainly uh, what we see is that in some cases, lack of direct communication to sensor units, uh, the need for many external components, a lack of... Uh, integration. So uh, that said, of course, there are requirements and benefits to field bus structures. Uh, the SPE solution is a new one, and uh, there may be some uh, use for interfacing directly with sensors uh, in the case of SPE uh, without too many external components, uh, especially the NV smart sensors, which can be digressed by the SPI directly. Uh, but, uh, yeah, this is, uh, this is all we had to discuss today. So I uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Jake. Um, and um, uh, if we have any questions, we're happy to. All right. Them we have them. <laughs> so there's, there's one question, uh, that you mentioned that there is a three by three, um, a point three by point three millimeter TMR chip size. What is the smallest package you can, uh, build? This is a wafer level chip scale. We have no no physical package this small. So it's just the die with solder bumps. Um, yeah, we, we uh, these are brand new. So we, we actually don't have them on the website right now, but we're happy to provide information if you have questions. Okay. Uh, then there's a second question uh, popping up. Do you have noise measurements for data for AKT-001? <laughs> <laughs> one specific part uh i don't know if we've taken the data but you know we can we have all the equipment still it's uh i can ask someone to do it today mm -hmm. i don't have any time today but i've uh, i've done the noise measurements myself many times just need to make sure the battery is charged on the preamplifier sure we can do yeah. that thank you um there's a question on how I do can understand a dual switch uh, you mentioned in a single package. A dual switch would mean uh, typically that there's more than one uh, magnetic operating point and a separate output. So if you have a, a switch product, maybe it's a package with a four pin, say pin one, VDD, pin two, ground, pin three, one output with the CMOS, and pin four, another output with the CMOS. But they're independent and they operate at different magnetic fields. Mm -hmm. Or they could operate at the same one if you want redundancy. Yeah, there's a, but uh, yeah, we have a few product capable of dual switch output. Okay, thank you. Um, well, next question is about the uh, uh, ADD converter. 
Uh, are you using uh, different kind of uh, converters? Is it like a sigma delta or SAR, simple SAR converter? And is that uh, part of a processor that is, or microchip that is in integrated? That's a good question. We have a few different uh, processing chips, A6 digital cores. Uh, some of them are just simple microcontrollers. Some of them are application specific sigma conditioning circuits. Uh, the specific architecture of the ADC, I'm not sure, honestly, I'd have to think about it. And the one we showed is the 12-bit. Um, I don't know about that one. I think the okay. high resolution, we have an 18-bit Sigma Delta. Yeah, that should be SAR, 12-bit, usually. Yeah. Um, okay, thank you. Um, thank you for your question. The next question is, um, let me see that. Uh, you mentioned a kind of a um, self-programmable lookup table. Do you have any uh, lookup tables prepared for standard magnets? And uh, the that's a good question. Question, re question related to that is how how large is the accessible memory size? <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, this is a good question. Uh, so the. To answer your question, we, we don't have anything available as standard yet. Uh, the only thing we've we've done is uh, specific custom requirements. Uh, we will release some information soon about standard magnet. Uh, the exact addressable memory size is uh, is a good question. I I don't remember, and I know it's it's not very much. <laughs> so if you want to do a, a lot, uh, we need a new chip probably. Uh, mm. Let let us know what you might be thinking, but I, yeah, just thinking off the top of my head, it may be, um, mm -hmm. mm, a couple, uh, couple megabytes or something. No, no, oh, no, uh, kilobytes a couple for... kilobytes. Yes. Well, yeah, we, we will check and let the, the audience later know. Okay. The next question is, uh, what is the minimum flux density of a target magnet for accurate TMR operation? Minimum flux density of a target magnet. Well, it depends on your accuracy requirement. The most, uh, the most uh, demanding requirement for accuracy and weak magnetic field may be these linear actuator magnets. If you use a uh, magnetic pitch between north and south pairs. So again, uh, on this diagram here, at the very bottom in the middle, these uh, linear scales going north, south, north, south, north, south. Uh, yeah, you have a very small magnetic field from a, a very small pitch magnet, but you get a very high resolution, typically uh, 0 0.5, maybe 0 0.1 micron. Uh, but the magnetic field that the sensor is operating maybe at an air gap of 0 0.2 millimeters is around uh, 50 Ersted, five millitesla at most, maybe as low as uh, 20 mm -hmm. or two millitesla. Okay. Maybe, uh, may maybe if you could ask the follow-up question, which application? If it's rotary encoder, for example, then the answer is three millitesla or in some cases, a 1.5 millitesla. Yeah. And there's a next question that's regarding uh, encoders uh, with the BISS interface. <laughs> oh, yeah, we have BISS interface. <laughs> uh, this is a good question. Uh, we are actually looking at some ICs that may be able to use this now. We don't have anything in our catalog right now, uh, but we uh, yeah, we can check. Will be interesting to see what basically is uh, well the, the BISS interface is, is very common in Europe. Of course. And, uh, yes. More question of is there anything on the roadmap or um, it's also connecting, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, we're just in the feasibility process now. Uh, yeah, we will uh, we'll provide some more information soon on those. Thank you for letting us know your interest. Uh, that the question we answered already. 
Um, do you have a linear tape web sim tool, simulation tool, basically, I think? Um, because you have on the on the website, there are plenty of simulation tools, um, like for gear tools. You know, I, I built one years ago, but it, it's really slow. <laughs> uh, it could probably be integrated in the website now because we've made some improvements to the website. But it's, uh, yeah. I have it run on my desktop. Actually, it's a little, it's a little slow. Uh, I, I, I see if we can get it into the website. Linear tape simulator. Thank you. Um, <laughs> Interesting question. Do you believe more in IO link or in future SPE? <laughs> I uh, I would defer to the, the customers. <laughs> um, in general, I don't know. I think IO link has maybe been surprising to everyone for its resilience and popularity over uh, many years. Whether SPE will become relevant as well, um, I'm not sure. Uh, yeah, we think it could be an, an important, promising new way, but uh, I don't know. So you're saying your first step currently is uh, we have a product that you can connect to a, to a, a SPE chip yes. from, from whatever company, but it's not that you're you're scheduling something that is integrating that, that uh, interface into the sensor, because then it's getting larger probably. Yeah, the well, the sensor die will be a little larger. We probably just, uh, you know, deposit or RMR directly on top of it, or maybe do a stack die approach. Uh, uh, yeah, we plan to advertise the SP solution a little more, mm -hmm. just to see if uh, more interest is generated from it. But for now, it's mainly an idea. Yeah. So um, checking if there are any more questions. Uh, no. Right. Okay. So if no more questions, then uh, Jake, if you have more questions <laughs> to the audience, or uh, do you want any more web calculators? Sometimes no. I don't know how many people use them. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I. I I have actually the guy who makes them all, believe it or not, because I have a math degree. Uh, so let me know if you need more web calculators, because sometimes I just say uh, people don't use them that much and I don't, I don't pay attention. But if you have some interest, just send send us an email. You know, we'll yeah. we'll make one. It's not the big deal. Okay. There's a one popping up already now. Uh, mm -hmm. Another one that's uh, about ESD protection. If that is that included in in, in the chip. Um, or how, how large is the... Uh, oh, with MR? Yeah, ESD, maybe I, it's a opportunity to talk about it here. So uh, in GMR, ESD is generally less a concern. Uh, they're fairly robust to ESD. If you're g going to apply so much ESD that you destroy this, it typically fails as open circuit. But uh, many times we don't integrate ESD. Uh, they can achieve maybe two KV on their own. TMR, especially in the past, have been notorious for uh, failing as short circuits when the ESD is applied. Uh, in most of our products, we have protection diodes integrated into the foundry wafer layers. So it provides two to four KV uh, ESD. Thank you for answering that question. All right, uh, there, there are no more questions and I, I have to thank you, Jake, for, for your time. Thank you uh, to the audience for participating in. And uh, have you yes, seen... the participation was very good. Thank you everyone for voting. So we, we appreciate have seen, it. You've seen the, the contact details in the back. Uh, you, will get, you will get this uh, presentation uh, uh, later. Um, or send us a note or, or uh, give us a call or to the salespeople you know and uh, 
have to say thank you. <laughs> That's it for, for today. And uh, I hope to see you next time session. Thank you, Jake. And uh, thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Bye, thank you very much.